morning. Welcome to our 53rd Coffee with the Commissioner event. Um, we're up this morning. There's a lot going on. And uh, today we've got a special, uh, well, a, kind of a, a unique event. We don't have a, an outside guest. We've just got um, members of our county staff here that uh, have all really played a, a pretty heavy role in how we've dealt with COVID-19. Um, this morning, we've got Janice Gilly, our county administrator. We've got Eric Gilmore, who is our emergency manager. And we also have Chief Rich Powell, who runs our jail and our road uh, prison, road camp. And uh, um, each of them, we're just going to go around the horn. Each of us are going to um, talk about our things and we're going to bounce uh, some things around about COVID and some other uh, current events that are going on. Meanwhile, I would encourage you if you have questions for any of us here, you know, set, send them through on Facebook because this is live on Facebook. So again, I want to thank everyone for being here this morning. I know it's early, but love doing these. Uh, it's a great opportunity to get information out and also to hear from constituents in real time. And then of course, we archive this and we put it on Facebook later, and we also put it on our website later so that folks can refer back to it for information. So uh, without further ado, we're going to start with you, Janice. There's been a lot going on. It's been a, a really busy couple of weeks. Before I do kick it to you, though, I, I did want to take a moment of personal privilege and, uh, and congratulate Dr. Timothy Smith, who was just uh, last night hired by the Escambia County School Board to be our area's first appointed superintendent. We've officially joined the rest of the 21st century and every other school district in the country, I think 99.5% of them have been doing it this way for a while where they elect a great school board and they go out do a nationwide search and hire the very best, most qualified superintendent. Very glad that this, uh, that this happened in 2018, that that passed. And now we've got a, a really, really fine uh, superintendent candidate from the Orlando area. Apparently he's done a lot of great things down there. So um, as a 10 year school board member, former school board member, all three of my kids went to these schools. I went to these schools. We've all got a vested interest in the county. We have a tremendous vested interest in making our schools the best they can be. So congratulations to Dr. Smith. We wish you well, and I look forward to meeting you and, uh, and speaking with you. So Janice, without further ado, I'm going to bounce it to you for your update. Good morning. Yes, thank you. Um, so I have enjoyed doing these these coffees, and so I appreciate you doing them with us um, each week. It is we've had some really good guests over the past several months, and I think your questions have been great. So I really appreciate this opportunity as well. Um, so you know, one of the things that we're dealing with is not only just COVID as um, a, a health in situation in our community, uh, the federal government has provided through the state to us some funds to be able to help us deal with that. And so you as the board um, have been looking at how we would expend those funds. Um, one of the things that we've already started is the rent mortgage and utility assistance program. Yes. Um, that particular program was about $900,000 to the county and the city. And um, it, they do have a little bit of uh, stringent requirements for that particular program, but we did open it yesterday. We have already received several hundred applications. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to make sure that folks knew, though, was that um, you do have to have been impacted by COVID from a uh, loss of income perspective to be able to qualify. And so that's one of the things that we want to make sure the word gets out. We tried very hard yesterday to make sure that there was clarity in the, um, app, in the uh, requirements or eligibility for that program, if it might not have been necessarily that clear beforehand. Um, but according to our staff, we have received a considerable amount of requests above and beyond what we are going to be able to hand out. Well, look, um, can, I, can I interject real quick and ask you a question? This comes as some, somewhat of a surprise to me, given that the meeting last Thursday, we were told that we wouldn't be able to accept them. What, what method are we using to accept these applications? I mean, do we have a, I mean, how, how are they, how are people uh, applying for this? Mm -hmm. So there's two ways. One way is they, uh, some folks have dropped them off, you know, in hand uh, to the Brownsville or to here at the county facilities. The other way is um, we did create our, our IT staff was able to create an online um, application. And so that application is out there and available. Um, we is that are at our website. Is that on our website right now? Yes. Yes, sir. Wow. It's mm -hmm. When you go on the front page, there is a click to go to that particular application. Okay. Uh, CARES Rent and Mortgage. Um, we, the goal is for us to get all of those uh, on a program called Neighborly right. um, before we release the next two uh, programs, whether it be the individual grants or the business grants. And so it would all be managed on that, port, that Neighborly portal. Um, it's, it's always going to be a click from our website to the CARES front page um, mm -hmm. grant program. And then from there, you'll have the drop down menus to be able to apply online, or you can also print a copy of the application and make sure that our folks help you with it. And let me ask you this. And I'm 
sorry to keep interjecting, but um, after the meeting on Thursday, you know, we talked about income requirements. I saw some different things on different media sites yesterday. Where are we at on that? I think the board spoke about a $45,000 threshold. And, uh, but I saw something different on a different media site yesterday. So what's the true story? Um, I don't know about a difference um, on the income threshold. So for the individual and families, uh, we're going to bring to you all tomorrow an implementation plan that asks for the income level to be $45,000. That's what I remember us saying. That, that's why. Yes, I would, but uh, on one of the blog sites, it said that there was some sliding scale and a family of eight could have income up to 80000 And I'm like, well, I don't know what this garbage yeah. is. It's not real news. It's fake news. Okay. Um, okay, so that that may be specifically talking about the rent and mortgage. That rent and mortgage program that the that the state of Florida has set up mm -hmm. is one hundred and twenty percent of the area medium income. So that program is a little different. Um, so I would just mention that. Um, let me ask you though: Is our rent and mortgage program going to align with that, or are we still sticking with forty five thousand? The forty five thousand is only for our individual slash household. That is the separate. That's a separate CARES uh, grant. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately, there are there are multiple pots of money, yeah, and so that. yeah. But yeah. the forty five thousand, I would just share with you. We are going to ask that um, that that be just uh, two thousand dollars for the household or family, um, and that way we don't have to uh, necessarily determine how many people are in the home because that is where it gets extremely complicated. Um, for, so, for example, this rent and mortgage is 80%, I mean, 120% of AMI, but you have to validate the people in the home, which mm -hmm. means you have to have all everyone's social security card, um, and then you have to go back and make sure that those are the people that actually live in that home, which means it can um, delay the time frame in which people can get money. So what we're going to recommend to the board tomorrow uh, is that we stick with one dollar amount, which would be two thousand dollars per household for any family with an income less than forty five thousand hmm, dollars. OK, well, I, I, I that's great. I mean, I'm just wondering if if there are a lot of folks who did not know about this. You're saying that we've already had enough applications or a number of applications that would consume the amount of money that we have available. So what about folks that didn't know about this? I mean, are they just out of luck or how does that all work? So what we're hoping is um, there is another pot of money through, mm -hmm. through the CDBG that we will release. So this money from Florida Housing Finance had a deadline of December 30th to mm -hmm. be expended. The CDBG grants um, do not necessarily have the same time frame. So that will be the next pot of money. And that's about another $800,000. Fantastic. Well, mm -hmm. that's great news. And I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just, uh, I, I'm, I'm certain folks that are watching have questions and, and may not. Yes. And I think, I think your questions are perfect because um, we do need to make sure that we get the word out in such a way that um, everyone has an opportunity to know. We did advertise this last one for 10 days, but I think that um, we will definitely do a better communications effort on the household and individual, you know, family ones, because it will be a lower bar in terms of the data that we're going to ask. Um, that the families provide us. And we'll, we'll provide that to you tomorrow. But quite frankly, it's going to be very easy to apply. It'll be your driver's license, your social security card, and then your 2019 income tax, the front page of your um, 1099 that shows you the, I mean, 1040, that shows you your um, income level. And, so, and let me ask you, because one, one of the questions that came up last Thursday during our special meeting was, uh, what about those folks who don't have to apply? Uh, file social security, how are we going to handle the vetting them? Okay. So there's two, one of the things there is, we're going to have a box that says, if you're a non-filer, what is your reason for non-filing? Okay. Um, and then it's our understanding that there was a um, database that was generated by the federal government for when they did the, uh, the stimulus checks, mm -hmm. they actually had a list of those folks that were non-filers so that they could check against that list. So, so our goal is to get access to that list. Otherwise, there will be, um, you know, self-attestation where you ba basically self-certify that here's where you qualify for those things. Well, and, and, and like, you know, there's no way to eliminate all fraud with these kind of programs. You're giving out money. I mean, we saw the Paycheck Protection Plan. We saw folks that are doing better business than they've ever done before get millions of dollars. It's, it's just a big. And so here, you know, we're going to squabble over a $2,000 payment to a family who, you know, the problem is when you have these sorts of programs, it's just impossible to eliminate all the fraud. So there will be people that will get this money that don't deserve it. There'll be people going to the casino with the money or buying jewelry or doing things at the pawn shop. It's just going to happen. Unfortunately, it's sad. I wish we could say 
unequivocally that it won't, but it just will. When you're good at free money, there's people that will work the system. I just feel bad because I know that there will be people that need it, that will not know how to navigate it and not be able to, and they won't be able to get it. So I just, you know, anyway, with that there, um, I'm just glad well, that we, share, we share your concern. And so we have written a fraud policy and we do have some fraud. Uh, the integrity group has provided us with some fraud training. Good. Um, and so we will have our folks work on that. Um, things like, you know, how to look at the driver's license and see if the hologram is right. But then maybe it says male when it's a female picture, you know, right. um, just things like that. Yeah. Teaching. I, you I hope they don't need training for that, but okay. <laughs> Right. Well, the M or the F or, you know, or then looking at the numbers and making sure that you have that accurate. So that's that piece. And then on the business piece, um, we are working with the SBDC again, and we have, we have actually simplified that application substantially. So it's not a financial analysis. It's mostly um, here are the businesses that qualify and here's the documentation that they need to qualify. And you all said from zero to 25 employees, it was 7,500 and from 26 to 50, it was 10,000. Dollars, and right. so that will be the other piece that we will do. Um, that I would say that our staff and our uh, the folks that we're working with are working really hard to make sure that we have a, we have places for access so that we can assist folks with their applications, um, and then making sure that we date and timestamp those applications so that they are com they are competitive with the ones that are coming in um, through the portals. Um, I would say yesterday with Meredith, with the rent and mortgage utility, uh, we only had 16, um, as of yesterday, as of late last night, I was only made aware of 16 actual um, paper manual applications. The other 300 and something were done online. Wow. So, and and just, so, just, for clarif just for clarification, so the number of applicants that we already have, if, if they're all valid, consumes the entire pot, more than consumes the entire pot of money. Yeah, yes, sir. No, that's what I was afraid of. The gold rush is on, right? So there we yeah. go. And so we are going to ask you probably for a more limited time on the household uh, family grant. I think you all had said 10 days. Our gut says five will be a gracious plenty. Right. Um, but so we'll be, I'll be talking with the team today about how we would implement that over a weekend. Mm -hmm. um, because as you know, a lot of people need to have a place to be able to deliver those over the weekend um, or after hours. So right. we were talking 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. type thing. Good. And then weekend. So we are trying to do everything we can to accommodate uh, people in all different, uh, you know, different status of whether or not they have a computer or they have availability to come and, um, you know, fill out an application Monday through Friday. And uh, the other thing I would mention is, um, you know, so we've only gotten that first $14 million. Uh, we have been in contact with FDEM to see how we could get the next 75%. But I will share with you that um, they would really like us to spend every penny of the 14 million before we get the next 75%. Don't you so, love that? They, they want all the money right now, but then they want to withhold it from us. You see the way Tallahassee works? I love it. Isn't that great? Well, yeah. yeah I mean, they want I, to spend this money. I, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So that wasn't extremely encouraging because what we were hoping was is that we could present a plan to them and they would release the funding. Um, but it's my understanding that a couple of counties have provided a plan, but they have not released. They've been very hesitant to release that funding. But, so Janet, as, but, now, but now wait, the larger counties, didn't they get all their money right up front? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm only talking. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm talking about the 55 of us that are below the yes. 100,000. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, I just, an, it's an unfair double standard and it's not yeah. right. We got to talk to our delegation about that. That That's just not right. I mean, we should yeah. be treated the same as they are, you know, with a, with a, with a, you know, commensurate reduction in the amount based upon our population, but we, we should not be, the money shouldn't be withheld from us mm -hmm. if it's not withheld from the other counties. And I just don't understand that double standard, mm -hmm. but anyway, that's just. Yeah. And, yeah, it's, it's, it is frustrating. Um, and the other thing that we, you know, like yesterday we got another, uh, uh, missive, I guess, for lack of a better term, or guidance from FEMA on how they will be letting us um, do reimbursements for like PPE and things like that. I don't know if Eric had a chance or Chief Powell had a chance to see it, but quite frankly, in the future, when we purchase PPE, it needs to be for the medical and the health and the public safety professionals. So it wouldn't be for like all of our employees at COC or animal control. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so that was a new, that was a new twist. Um, we're getting used to getting these uh, guidance and directives every couple of weeks with a little twist, but we are taking note of them. We are doing sure that we are following those guide guidelines. So it, that's been a little 
crazy. Well, I think, I think you, Janice, you also had mentioned before we started that you wanted to talk about the census because we know that's incredibly important. Yeah, um, so I know that we've talked about this before, but the census is extremely important. Um, one of the things that we're hoping to do is to hit an 80% mark uh, for Escambia County. In the past, I believe our highest was about 72% and uh, of, of those that have reported. Uh, folks are going door to door with census. Um, they are supposed to be very well identified um, so that folks, you know, don't have to be nervous about them. Um, it's not too late to respond. You can do it by phone, you can do it by app, or you can also do it by the person that comes. Um, as I've mentioned to Chief Powell and others, we need to make sure that we, uh, anyone that we have in our uh, custody, that we do make sure has either filled it out or gets filled out as part of the census. Um, we, need, we need the Department of Corrections to also do that up in Century. We need the university to help us with students that live on campus. Um, and then also anyone that's at the Navy base that's stationed at the Navy base, uh, they also need to fill it out because even though this, they may be um, Arizona residents, they're, they're physically living here. And so we want them to be counted here in Escambia County. Yeah, yeah they do still have a cost to us, right? Okay. So, um, so we'd like to have that. Um, the other thing is this, you know, one of the things that the census does, I know some people are a little nervous, but the questions are really, really easy. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think... Quite frankly, I think we share more personal information whenever we sign up to get a new app than we probably <laughs> do for the census now. Oh, yeah. um, so, so anyway, I would just encourage folks to do that. And then I did want to do a shout out. Um, Chief Powell can certainly speak more to this. But, you know, last week we had that manhunt and yes. the sheriff. Yeah, Chief Powell can give you the details. But um, our little guy, Shorty is the one that he ultimately is the one that found the um, man and he found him quite quickly. And uh, so we're really thankful to have that resource at the, at the uh, camp at Work Annex. You know, that team, if you've ever seen it work, works really well. Um, and they really are a good resource. I mean, I, Chief Powell can talk about how many times they're called out to help. But so far that I'm aware of, every time they're called to help, they get their guy or their girl. And um, they've just done a great job. So no, I, I want to hear, hear about that. Chief, uh, yeah. do you worry about me? Okay, so the dog, the, you say, are they bloodhounds? Tell us about that. Tell us about that. Oh, we, have, we have a variation of it's primarily our beagles and we do have bloodhounds. It depends on what we're looking for. Um, our beagles are very stealthy. They're quiet. Uh, and, and you hear a beagle barking all the time, but our dogs won't bark when they're on a scent for the primary, especially Shorty. Shorty's very quiet. He's, he's an old man, if you will, but, but he's, he's probably got a, a, a rate in the 90 percentile of finding every time. Um, and, and Shorty's very, very quiet uh, as he's moving through the woods. This individual w was known to have a long rifle, so we knew that he was going to have a beat on us before we had a beat on, you know, could see him. Right. So rather than taking uh, the younger beagles in who like to bay and bark and, and, and raise all kinds of ruckus, they dropped Shorty in. Shorty got on the trail, uh, processed through, took him within, within a couple yards uh, of the individual uh, and, and, and had him. Um, and it's not just for, for criminals. We've used uh, our canines to find Alzheimer's patients uh, that have wandered away from their house. I mean, since I've been here for the last two years, we've had multiple call outs just to help individuals in the community. You remember probably a little over a year ago, there was a bunch of kids that went missing. They went to the woods uh, and, and we dropped the dogs in, tracked them back and they had a little camp set up and we found them and their parents were very pleased with that. So. Uh, yeah, the, the canine team out there is, is phenomenal. The, the men that run those dogs are, uh, let's just say, not afraid to go in areas that a lot of people would never go. And what I mean by that is walking through a swamp and waist deep following the dog trail is not going to stop them. Uh, I've watched them literally climb, climb, take the dog and climb over thickets that you physically couldn't walk through wow. and, 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 and crawl through to stay on that scent. Uh, so, yeah, the, it's an impressive group. So when, let me ask you this. So when Shorty's on the trail, he's not making noise, but obviously this guy's got a 30 out six. That's what was reported. And he's not afraid to shoot at you. Were there, were there, did you have your men with the dog to protect the dog too? I mean, what did. Or, Absolutely. Did, I mean, anytime you've got a dog on the ground, they're on a, on a long leash, but they're still susceptible to anything. Uh, and and the, the SRT, excuse me, the SWAT team from the sheriff's office was literally on our guys' shoulders as we're okay. working the dogs through. So, I mean, our guys are armed to the teeth too. Uh, in case they do get in a firefight, but primarily our handlers are watching the reactions of that dog. The dog, will, in this case, Shorty, when he gets within a close proximity, his head comes up off of the scent and he's trying to wind, if you will, 
to figure out exactly where this individual's at. You know, so you knew you were close. You knew you were yeah, close. The handlers read the dogs. Wow. And, and when the dogs react, they know exactly how, what kind of proximity that they're within of the individual that they're looking for. Oh, that's, that's a great story. Yeah, that, that one didn't come out in the media. That's, that's really, really great. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you for that resource. And uh, yeah, that's really cool. Well, Rich, well, I know we got to get to Eric and then I'm going to come back to you about some issues at the jail that we want to talk about, but I know Eric is short on time. So uh, Eric Gilmore, uh, Escambia County Emergency Manager, thanks for being up early with us this morning. We, you want to talk about the tropics? Uh, I know there's some systems out there, nothing that's going to get to us, but. Right. No, there, there, there's some systems out there and, uh, you know, we got Tropical Storm Nana and we got Tropical Storm Omar out there, Omar mm -hmm. into the Atlantic. Not going to affect the mainland of uh, the United States. And then you got Nana down there in South America. Uh, we are entering the peak of hurricane season, if you will. Uh, September 15th is kind of the peak uh, for hurricane season. We've already seen 13 active named storms uh, by September 1st, which is the most they've seen in a while, or the most they've seen. I think, I think the most they've seen. So uh, I want to remind everybody be vigilant out there. Uh, we did dodge a bullet with Laura. Uh, you know, got Friday before last, they had Laura. Right across there's Laura, and uh, I, you know, it's seven days out. I like our odds when they put us in the crosshairs that early. I'd, I'd rather be in the crosshairs that early than 48, 24 hours out. So, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, uh, fortunately for us, uh, she went to the uh, west. Unfortunately for Louisiana, uh, you know, Lake Charles area, they, they took it uh, pretty good. And, and we, uh, Scamby County has sent to Lake Charles, uh, we've sent them our shower trailer. So, our shower trailer and a camper is over in Lake Charles assisting. Uh, Florida, uh, not Florida, I'm sorry, uh, Louisiana Highway Patrol, Troop D, 20-plus uh, uh, troopers over there lost their homes and are living out of the precinct. Oh, man. So happy to be able to send our resources over there to assist those guys so they have shower facilities and somewhere to uh, bed down. That's not much, but it's, it's, it's something to get them started. So uh, they're very gracious and uh, grateful for that. We haven't seen any manpower, uh, but just assets. But I do want everybody to be very well aware of the heightened season that we're in, you know, they predicted above average and it, it's performed so far. Uh, it always just, it just takes that one. So I want everybody to remember, you know, your, know your zone, go to be ready. be ready. Scamby.com. Know your zone, know your home. Is it resilient? Uh, have you mitigated? Can you stay there? And due to COVID, you don't want to go to a shelter primarily. You want to, you want to go somewhere comfortable and then uh, know your plan. So we want to remind everybody those three things. Well, let me ask you about, about COVID specifically. What we're seeing now, it's fewer testing, uh, fewer folks getting tested. Is that, is that to be expected? I'm going to give you a multi-part question because um, it looks like we've got about 83,137 uh, tests. That's from our dashboard this morning, 11,256 cases total. But what's really encouraging is the hospitalizations appear to be way, way yes. down, down to 110. I know yes. at one point we were at like 250 people sitting in hospital beds in, a, in Pensacola, Scandy County. So that, that's actually encouraging, but is, um, let's talk about testing. Uh, why are the numbers down? Are people just, is there testing fatigue or uh, let's talk about that. It's a culmination of fit, testing fatigue. Uh, people going back to work, uh, not having time. Uh, some of the testing sites have uh, shut down across the state that we're not performing at high standards. So it's a culmination of many things. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're not seeing the testing numbers that we did before. We're having our, our partner meetings every week. So we meet with the hospitals and they were very encouraging this week with what they were seeing in house and what they, what, you know, what was happening, but they did warn and caution us about Labor Day weekend coming up. We saw the spike in Memorial Day and everything and, and 4th of July holidays. And you're right. We did see, uh, I think we had 246 was our highest inpatient uh, starting July and we just ramped up and hit a spike. And we have been on a trend downward now, which we want to, we want to maintain that trend and remain at 5.5% positivity. We was above 10% at one time. Yeah. Uh, what was we at 14, somewhere around there, really high. So, uh, what, uh, but the, the hospitals did more, you know, watch out for, for Labor Day. Right. So we want to make sure that people are doing what they're supposed to be doing, washing their hands. So keep continue doing what you're doing. It's working, washing your hands, social distancing, wear a mask. If you can't uh, be, uh, if you can't social distance, do those things, to protect yourself. So. Absolutely. I apologize. The sun's coming through my. It is. It's good. Yeah. It's weird. That's never, I, I just got to step away for one second. I'm going to close this blind. Okay. Hey, Eric, did you want to mention um, the quest diagnostic diagnostic issue that has come out yeah, no, just, um, where there were tests all the 75,000 test April. backlog. Yeah. yeah. All the way back to April, April. Uh, so I, I don't know the whole story there. I don't know. 
I don't know who found them. I guess Quest uh, owned up to it, and uh, Governor DeSantis has since cut Quest out. So we're using alternate laboratories, uh, Jeanette Works. Um, you know, um, there was three other uh, E True North, um, the one that they were using uh, for the state. So they've cut Quest out because of the massive backlog, the seventy-five thousand uh, backlog that they had even going back as far as April. So I haven't got the full story on, on what happened there, but uh, yes. So. Yeah, I think that was in the media yesterday. They dumped a ton of tests from way back in April, and and really the data is stale at this point. It really doesn't help anyone, and no. I, the governor just said, forget it. <laughs> Good for him. So are we using Quest anymore? So how does that affect us in Escambia County? So we will not be using Quest. If we're doing any uh, any state sponsor, uh, we're not using Quest for the private hospital, for the hospitals. I know Sacred Heart's doing their own in, in-house. Uh, they're doing uh, their own antigen testing in-house with their analyzers and everything. I think a lot of the hospitals are sending their stuff there as well so they can get a, a quicker turnaround. Uh, I'm sure we still are using some uh, laboratories out there. I don't know if it's Quest, uh, but uh, I do know we are using some laboratories out there in some instances. Uh, the state will not be using Quest, so anything at the state site like, well, it will not be Quest. I can tell you that. Yeah, we got that. We got that message loud, <laughs> loud and clear, and clear. Yeah. <laughs> from the governor. Well, I know, Eric, you've got, is there anything else you'd like to, to bring to our attention? I know you got to run. you got a lot going on. No, sir. I appreciate the time to get the message out. And Absolutely. No, thank you. Continue doing what you're doing. It's working. Or the numbers are going down. Uh, be safe this Labor Day. <laughs> be safe. Yeah. And, uh, follow the rules of, that we've been following, and uh, we'll get through this. And, okay. and before Eric goes, I, I would like to acknowledge, um, so people think that Eric just works in emergency management. Eric is also a volunteer firefighter, and so he uh, responds to calls, and as he shared with us earlier, he didn't get home until 3.30 a.m. this morning because he was responding to a call in the North End. And that is not uncommon for him. So I just want to recognize Eric. He's committed to our community, not just as a civil servant, but also as a public servant, as a volunteer. And so I just want to make sure that we thank him for his service. I mean, it, it, he, he's an example for so many of us. Um, you know, I might work and then go home and do paperwork but Eric works and then goes and takes care of our health and safety. And I just appreciate him. Yeah, hey, Eric, that's, that's fantastic. Thank you for doing that. You know, I, I'm a big, big, big proponent of the volunteer firefighters. And so you, are you out at Walnut Hill or where are you at? Where do you? Uh, McDavid. McDavid. Okay. Yes, sir. Wow. Well, thanks for what you do. And, uh, you know, you're an example of why we love our volunteer firefighters. I mean, they, they work jobs, they're fully certified, and then they come and then they give their time. They give their time. And they save us a lot of money. So, uh, Janice, as you know, that's one of the biggest things I'm going to be pushing for in the next 50 months, four years and two months that I'm going to be in this job unless I die, is we've got to find a way to get back and value and value these volunteer firefighters like Eric Gilmore and the ones that work for the military and the DOD and the other um, jurisdictions. And they want to come here with their certifications and give us their time instead of knocking them off the log like King Kong in that movie. We should be welcoming them. And so, Eric, thank you for doing that. And uh, I'm glad you segued into that, Janice. That's, that's probably the most important initiative that I'm going to push for. We love our firefighters. We love them. But we especially, especially love our volunteer firefighters because they give their time. And um, they cost us a lot less money, too. And they want to do it. Eric, let me ask you one question about that. So you, you've been a volunteer yes, fireman. Um, you do it. You, you give your time. Uh, let me ask you something. Why, why do you do it? I mean, I, I, it's kind of a personal question, but, uh, you know, because people, there's, there are some people out there that question the motivations for people to volunteer. I mean, and I'm speaking specifically about union people who don't want volunteers. They, they right. should get rid of all volunteers. They're crazy. They're nuts. I think, what is it, like 69% of the country is covered by volunteer firefighters, something like that? It's, it's pretty high. It's, uh, I, think the, I think the tides are turning. We're seeing volunteerism down. Uh, because we're we're going to turn that, we're going to turn that around in a scam oh. account. <laughs> Right. So I, why I do it is, a, you know, it's a, it's a pride in the community. Um, I, I was raised with, uh, you take pride in your community, uh, help your community any way you can. I've been doing this for 25 years. Uh, and before I was doing that, my, my father was a, a volunteer. So it's kind of in the family as well. Uh, so we've kind of followed in with him and uh, doing it. Uh, we've had good friends come in and, and take that sense of pride in community and, and go out there and uh, join, join and get their search and train. Uh, you know, I, we're in the North End. Uh, you know, we're, we're the last line of defense up at North End. We don't have, you know, we've got one amb or two ambulances that stay up there. So, and then they're rotating through. So, uh, when they're busy, we're the guys that show up on scene. So, you know, we're, we're the last line of defense up there. And 
it's a sense of pride in the community and want to help your, your community out. Everybody knows us. We're a small group, uh, but everybody knows who we are. When we show up, they, they know we're, we're in capable hands. So it, it's, wow. we like it. Well, and I appreciate your brother, And your brother volunteers, too. I mean, I have, I have, so it's a family affair. I've got two brothers and myself and my dad uh, at uh, McDavid, yes. God bless you guys, man. God bless you. Thank you for what you do. We need more, we need more people like you, and we need to really value people like you, not just in the North End, throughout the county. Throughout the county, we need to value anyone who wants to volunteer. Now, since you got me onto that topic and I feel my blood pressure going up a little, just a little, I have to ask you, when you hear people say, well, they're not, you know, these volunteers, they're not reliable. What do you say to someone who would say that? We, you know, um, we're, we're, a, we're a true volunteer house, but I do work with career guys. And we, we have no problem with the career guys. Uh, we get along with them very well, and we train with them. So um, I don't think that we're viewed that way because we do try to train and let them understand where we come from, how, what we are capable of, and what our uh, skill set is. And then uh, we, get a, we get a little respect by doing that. So it's, it's a mutual right. and take. And in doing so, we've had great rapport with our, our career companies up north in the north end. And when we respond to the south end, they go, well, you know, here's Station 9. We know what they're about. We know how they train, and we've trained with them. So, uh, no, I, the, the volunteer, even though they haven't gone that extra 200, 100 hours to get the Fire 2 standard, mm -hmm. so you, you're hazmat, your first responder, your wildland fire, your ICS classes, your courage to be safe, your EVOC, your Fire 1 standards. No, I, no the, the volunteers trained. Uh, they just don't, they just don't work at that job every day. So, uh, but they are trained at a level to perform and get the job done. Wow. Well, thanks for that and for your family's uh, commitment to uh, help and protect the North End. We greatly appreciate you, Eric. Thank you for your time this morning, too. And I know that was probably not a segue that Janice really was wanting to put me into. But, you know, since we're there, I'm, I'm never, God, this, this window, I can't, I can't. Uh, anyway, I'm fighting the sun over here. I feel like the outfielder trying to make the catch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, okay, well, uh, Eric, thanks for that. Um, now we're going to go to Chief Powell. Now, there's been some stuff in the media. We'll see you, Eric. Have a great day. There's been some stuff in the media about, you know, certain inmates, pregnant females, begging for tests, not getting them. Can you, can you help clear up the myth, the mythology here that I'm hearing in the media, the fake news? Uh, well, yes, sir. The, the information is, is, yes, we do have inmates that are pregnant. Uh, and, and I will tell you that the care that the inmates that are pregnant are getting are probably – it's an assumption I'm going to make, but oftentimes I've seen it that people, individuals that come in that are pregnant have never even seen a doctor. They know they're pregnant, obviously, because uh, uh, of their condition that they're in, but they've never had any, any uh, care yet. So we'll take them through an OB clinic. We'll take them uh, to a doctor and, and, and start the uh, uh, prenatal uh, vitamins and the entire process that, that, uh, that a woman goes through when they're pregnant. Oftentimes, for the first time that they've ever had any decent medical care. Um, and we'll, as long as they're with us, we continue that process. Uh, and, and then the, the assumption or, or comments that have been made about these individuals are, have committed minor crimes is just, well, it depends on what your terminology of minor crime, aggravated battery with a deadly weapon. That's not a minor crime. Now, is that one of the, is that one of the pregnant females that were? That, that's one of the charges that, that we have some, some, some women that are in our custody with. And of course, I'm dealing with HIPAA issues, so I've got to walk sure. a thin line here. Yeah. Uh, aggravated assault, battery. Um, none of the individuals who are in our custody that are pregnant are in on a misdemeanor charge. Let's just put it that way. Uh, and, so that's, and part, so but that's part of the... That's part of the narrative in some fake news sites. They will say, well, you know, these are people that just, if they had a hundred dollars, they should be bought in. What I know too, from just personal experience, knowing a, you know, a judge, right? I know a judge and we talk very frequently about a, lot, a host of topics is that typically, you know, some of these people, sure, they might be in on a, what appears on its face to be a minor offense, but it's the 15th and it's the straw that broke the camel's back and, and boom, and they're in jail now, you know? So I would tell, they, you, I, I, I would tell you the, the, lowest charge that any of our pregnant females are in here on is a grand theft charge. Okay. Uh, so it's not a petty theft charge, it's not a shoplifting charge, it's grand theft, value over dollar X. Uh, and, and when I say that, I mean, we've got some, some heinous crimes as well. And from my opinion, you know, when I, when I look at the charge, when it's child cruelty and things like that, that's things that we, we just can't ignore as a society. Correct. Um, and, and, and the thought, the, the jail often catches the blunt of it uh, we're the holder of the individual. We're not the one who arrests them. We're not the one who keeps him incarcerated. That obviously is the court's process. Correct. So 
to to jab at the jail is it's a soft target. I understand it's an easy target because they're in sure. our custody, uh, and and often people hold us accountable for that conduct or that that position that we're in, which is fine. You know, it it is what it is. Uh, but if they want to affect that individual, then they they need to shift their target target to a different group of individuals right. who right. incarcerates them uh, and keeps them incarcerated. Um, but I, but I do want to I do want to say that um, you know Chief we've talked about this extensively um, you know I talk to you frequently about it and you have checked with your medical staff time and time again to ensure that there is the proper care being taken and then um, that they because they are in our care we do make sure that they do get their regular doctor visits um, we all have them on a schedule um, so and and that's my understanding you know based on your communications with the medical staff. So I wanna make sure that folks know that um, any, in, any inmate that's in our care does is required to get the medical care that they need. And so maybe Chief Powell, you might wanna talk a little bit more about just the general population and the type of medical care that you provide that we are responsible for paying for. Um, because while it is a very sensitive topic to talk about this, this one particular group, um, we take care of all the inmates and their medical concerns, not only with a daily sick call, but also if they have existing uh, circumstances that we, you know, we're now obligated to, to take care of. Oh, yes, ma'am. The, the, and the illnesses range no different than what's in our community right now. Everything from, from a, a, a broken bone to full-blown AIDS. Uh, and, and we carry them all the way through while they're in our custody, uh, ensuring that they receive the care that, that's appropriate for their illness or their injury. Uh, and, and it's not uncommon. Uh, for for somebody to seek incarceration almost of course they know that they're going to, because they're going to get some medical care uh, I, I I recall a quick story that that gentleman had a, an abscess tooth that he just couldn't deal with anymore walked up and threw a rock through a cop car to get arrested because he knew he was in jail <laughs> oh my god he, yeah no that's God's honest truth uh, because he knew that when he got to the jail the jail was going to give him the medicine that he needs and or have the tooth extracted that he needed. Um, but he had grown up in the system, so he knew the medical care that was waiting for him as soon as he got through the booking process. Um, and, and that's not a one-time event. That's happened multiple times in my career. And, and let me ask you this, because I'm aware of circumstances where there are people in for minor, maybe some minor offenses, and but with these astronomical health care costs, people with hepatitis and want you know, Harvoni or they want them and, and the type of treatment that really a lot of people that have insurance wouldn't even be entitled to, but we end up paying for it. Is it not true that we've been able to work with the judges to get some of these people out so that the taxpayers aren't paying for their uh, reconstructed dental procedures or these expensive medical treatments as particularly, like you said, if it's someone who just broke a window, we're going to get them out. That way we're not paying for it. If they're out, Medicaid pays for it. But if they're in, like, SKB County taxpayers pay for it. A lot of people don't understand that. That is true, yeah. right? We pay for yeah. it. The management of the operation within corrections is when we have an individual like you just described that we look like it's going to be a long-term medical care and it's a minor infraction, we often will contact the judge uh, that, that is presiding over it uh, and, and say, okay, what can we do to assist in getting this individual out? Uh, we pull the history, look at the history. There's not a criminal past. There's not a violent past. It's a minor, uh, relatively a minor infraction. Sometimes they will ROR them, uh, release them. Uh, sometimes they will just put them on a, 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 a furlough uh, mm -hmm. for a period of time. Uh, depending, of course, it's after an, a, an adequate assessment of the threat that, sure. that they could or would not pr or produce on the outside. Um, we know right off the bat if it's a serious charge, don't even bother the judge. Sure. We, we know we, we know that the, that's probably not going to occur. But, but let me ask you this. This is an important point right here to make. Doesn't this really doesn't this really indicate that just the necessity of us having a good rapport with our judges? Doesn't this just really point to the value in treating our judges well? Not, I mean, you know, absolutely. Not, not, I'm in communication with our judges, I, mean, <laughs> I would say almost daily, if not. I mean, so, two or three days. so it would be foolish. It would be foolish for the county to ever arbitrarily do something to upset the judiciary. I mean, right? Does that make sense? Well, I mean, that make from, sense? from my world, it's one system. From right. the law enforcement officer on the front side to sure. the probation officer all the way through the end of it uh, with, with the judicial system in the middle of it. Exactly. Uh, it it's one system. 
uh, and each one of us have a, an appropriate role in that system. Um, and it, it starts to break down when one aspect of it is not appreciated or, or given its due diligence. So yes, exactly. we, we, we work in a very uh, harmonious way. Uh, like I said, multiple judges and I talk frequently uh, throughout the week, uh, working on different cases and getting particular things uh, rolling, especially through this COVID. It's been kind of crazy for them as well. Yes, it has. Um, and, and actually, we're going to they're going to start some trials here uh, in the next couple of weeks. So we're working out transportation issues as well. Thank goodness. Let me let me talk let me talk a little bit about the road uh, camp, the road prison. I know there's been some mythology put out on fake news blog sites as well, and fake news tabloids locally here in town that never really quite get it right. Uh, why don't we clear up the, the real story? Didn't didn't someone publish yesterday that it was like 91% uh, positivity rate? What was the real story, Chief, on that? Well, I don't know where they got their information from, but it didn't come out of my office for sure. Um, I want to start with last Thursday, whenever you're where, Yeah, okay. That's where I was going to back up. Uh, last week, Thursday, one of our officers noticed one of the inmates that, that was looking a little peaked, if you will, uh, and just not his normal self because our staff interact with these uh, folks every day. And, and pulled him aside and, and said, hey, let's go take, get your temperature taken. And, and they took the temperature and he was slightly elevated. So uh, they said, okay, let's, let's see what's going on here. And they tested him or had him tested and uh, he tested positive. That caused us to shut the uh, work annex down just to make sure, okay, figure out if we've got another infection. Okay, how widespread is it within? Let's try to manage it and control it. Um, so Sunday we made the call to shut it down for this week and take a look at it. Uh, we were able to get one of the, we weren't supposed to get an analyzer or test her in until the middle of the month. Well, we made some phone calls this weekend. Uh, I was able to get one on Monday, stood nice. up Monday afternoon. We have some uh, correctional officers who are also EMTs. Uh, so we trained them because they're available 24 seven to us. Uh, so we, we got them trained on, on taking the test cycle. Uh, we use the terminology rapid testing. Uh, uh, it's, it's not as rapid as some may believe. Right. Uh, we're able to test three per hour is what it amounts to. By the time you do this, we'll have to do the testing, uh, do the calibration of the machine again over and over. So we're, we're, we've been running about three per hour since late Monday afternoon. And, and, and I can give you the numbers here this morning. Uh, we've tested a total of 60, 55 of them have been negative and five have, has resulted in a positive test, completely asymptomatic. The individuals have not even have no issues, but however, they're positive now, so we'll control their 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 exposure to others uh, and go through the process there to, to run that time through uh, as we move through. The um, Of course, we had voluntarily, so out of the 160, we had 80 that said, yeah, I'll take the test. So we've tested 60 of the 80 so far, and it's 55 and 5 right now. At, I mean, they started testing again at 6 o'clock. I don't know what they've tested in the first hour, what those results are yet. Well, a couple of things there I think that are very important to point out. I think the CDC guidelines, and I'm not exactly sure what they are now, but if you're asymptomatic, there's a whole different now uh, protocol now of what you have to do and what you can do, what you, how you can work and things like this. So when, when people are putting out fake news that it's 90% positivity and things of this nature, I mean, you know, it's, it's irresponsible. It's reckless. Uh, I'm certainly glad that, that you're here to correct the record. And, um, uh, but with all this said, the important thing is how quickly can we get the road crews back on the road? Because that we, the five of us really rely on you guys to keep our districts clean and you guys do a hell of a job. I mean, you really do. And with Wes Marino and Michael Rhodes from parks, I mean, the, just the, the, you know, the trio of staff, I, I just wish citizens knew how hard you guys worked. I mean, it's, they, you know, we take a lot of, we take a lot of body shots for a lot of things, but um, every single day, the staff, there's great things happening in this community. Work, hard work's being done on behalf of citizens, and I just wish uh, people knew that. But with that said, though, uh, the important thing for me, kind of selfishly, is when, when is that when is that road crew getting back on the road? Well, we actually were able to pull some other inmates that weren't out at the annex uh, from the main jail that were some of our workers. Uh, we and we put three crews on Monday, uh, actually five crews out on Monday, and some of the RCOs, road correctional officers rather than coming and working in the jail. Uh, I got some pictures yesterday of them on tractors, uh, nice. actually mowing lawns, uh, laying concrete, uh, and doing the work that our crews actually do just to keep, not rather than stopping the work, uh, our staff stepped up and said, okay, well, we can still do some of the labor uh, and, and let's go ahead and keep these projects rather than stopping the projects. Uh, so yeah, some of the, 
some of them were kind of interesting, the pictures that they sent me. And just, <laughs> well, uh, hey, I think that's great, but here's a, here's a dumb question from a guy who doesn't know anything about what you do. Uh, if they're on the lawnmowers and the tractors doing the work, then who's watching the prisoners? <laughs> no, no, those guys are the ones that take the crews out every day. Oh, okay. Um, but right. they, didn't have, they didn't have inmate crews to take out, so they still went to their job sites and gotcha. assisted okay. the, uh, the rest of the county staff in doing their job. No, I think that's, I think that's outstanding. I hope they get nominated for employee of the month. I, I love that. I love to hear that. Yeah, but who wants to sit in the office? If you got nothing to do. You might as well get out there and, and do it. That's fantastic. So what you're saying is in a phased way, you're, you're, you got, your guys are going back out as we speak. Right. And, and as these, the 55 that are negative, we will put them back into the cycle to be pulled and, and take back out to work too. Uh, we're able to put them in a different housing unit and still pull them out. Uh, so again, we still have to be conscious of, of the craziness is and nobody can give us a clear understanding of the incubation time of this disease. Yeah. You know, you may test negative today, but are a carrier. So we still have to be very, very careful and guided. Uh, and, and that's what we've done since day one. Observation is our, is our number one tell, telltale. Like I said, just through normal observation, we caught this last guy who had a low grade fever um, mm -hmm. and, and as a result was positive. So, so that's what we continue to, to do is, is observe the MA population. And since we have you here today, is there anything else, um, from the jail's perspective that you'd like, uh, I mean, I know we all take, uh, we take hits in the media, some of it, uh, you know, we own, but some of them are just unfair. And I know that the jail, like you said, you, you know, they blame you guys, um, but you're not the ones. I mean, you just, you can't even pick who your guests are. You just have to accommodate them and take care of them. And um, anything else that needs, anything in the record that needs to be cleared? Well, just a simple understanding that, that it's a revolving door. We take in 30 to 40 people every day. Uh, so, so our combat, we don't have a stagnant population that we can isolate, incubate and say, okay, we're clean. Uh, so, so it's a continuous revolving process of, of Johnny or Jane comes through the front door. We don't know exactly whether they're contagious or not. Uh, just like we don't know how violent they truly are. They may be arrested on a minor, and that's again, history have been in this for 30 some odd years. Johnny or Jane gets arrested on a minor charge. You run their prints. Well, they're one in three different States. For murder. <laughs> for, for, no, and, yeah, actually, yes, I've had that. Uh, so, so, yeah, they get arrested on a minor infraction here, but until we get their prints back, we don't know who we're dealing with. Right. And that's on all kinds of varying different degrees from, from, from now the COVID to how violent of a person is this individual really, right. uh, especially if they're not known to us. Yeah. Uh, the guys or gals that are doing uh, a life sentence on an installment plan, in other words, coming in for short periods of time through their whole life, uh, we know them. We know their mental health. We know that their their uh, their their behavior patterns. It's the unknowns that 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 are a challenge for our profession. And let me ask you something. I I was recently had the opportunity to read a a case about a um, it was a Supreme Court case about a gentleman who was on death row. His name was Muhammad. That wasn't his name. He changed his name once he got in there and um, and had befriended a guard. The guard took him out. I guess once a day for an hour or whatever, not, not befriended. I'm using the bad term, but he, you know, they had, you know, you just, you, you work with people, you get to know them, whatever the case might be. So he was upset about something about not, uh, not being able to have visitation because he didn't shave his beard because he decided he didn't want to shave his beard. So they said, well, okay, you're not going to have visitation. I guess they had a visitation period and um, he was angry about that. So he sharpened up a spoon and um, this guard that was always very kind to him, uh, took him, uh, went to get him to take him for his one hour out. And before anyone could save him, he had stabbed the guy like 15 times through the heart, killed, killed the guard. Um, and so what you guys do is, is very dangerous. Uh, and people don't realize that people don't, I, 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 unfortunately, I don't think people respect, you know, how difficult and dangerous the job is that you guys do. And like you said, you, you don't know who you're dealing with and you've got people with mental issues. Uh, we know about that. Uh, in fact, you had a prisoner that just left on Friday that had major mental problems. And now he's in the state's mental hospital. I read all about that too over the weekend as well. Um, so when I get back to that, I, I worry about your staffing because that, that is one thing that I've heard that, that we have continuous issue with. So tell us about your current level of staffing. I mean, it's a tough job. It's ob obviously you deal with violent people and dangerous people and um, you know, there's no glamor there whatsoever. Good, good, pe good pay and benefits and a pension if you stick it out for 30 years, but beyond that, you know, none of the glory. So uh, what's your, what's your current level of staffing at right now? Uh, we're carrying about 30 vacancies being completely candid. Uh, we, we struggle with that continuously. Uh, some of it has to do with, with, well, the very different things. Nobody sees, a lot of us stumble into corrections uh, as, as, a, as a career after the fact that we've tried something different or we've run a different problem. No, very seldom do people grow up and say, I want to be a correctional officer. 
right? Mm -hmm. Unless it's a family business. Um, and and that's, that does happen too. Um, just like firefighting as Eric spoke of before. Um, so, so our staffing, the men and women in, in, in corrections do a phenomenal job. Uh, they do a job that most people would never, ever, ever survive in. Uh, I've watched, I'll use my own brother, for example. He's a professional golfer. Uh, he got lost his position as running, and I took him into the jail in Orange County when I worked there and said, hey, look, you know, we're hiring. Take this out. He lasted about three minutes and said, uh, no, get me out of here. <laughs> uh, how you do, how do how, he, he literally, I mean, he used a lot of colorful expletives in, in that <laughs> Tell process. us exactly. What did he say? No, just no, I, no, no, no. no. Uh, uh, but, but he lasted about three minutes walking through and he says, I don't know how you exist in this world. But I, you know, as I told him, I, that's what we do. You know, it, we try not to become callous, but we do to, to, to deal Isn't with it. Isn't your sister an officer? My, my sister works for the state system, not as an officer, but as a classification officer oh, okay. uh, for the state system. Wow. Hey, well, um, I have a question uh, that just came through on Facebook. So talking about jails, um, they'd like to know what is the status of the new jail? Um, I know we're behind schedule. Janice, can you elaborate on that or, or Rich? I can. If you, Janice, yeah, please. please. Um, Rich, you can. Mm -hmm. From our meeting yesterday that took place, uh, the substantial completion is now mid-November. They've moved the date there because of um, goods and services that, that were delayed because of COVID. Uh, and, and so we're looking at substantial, which means that that's when they'll start doing punch list, uh, which means in, in reality, probably January, February, that we're operational if they meet their target of, of, uh, of, of, of November uh, being substantial. But that's a moving target still to this day. Uh, there, there's things that they've been waiting on uh, getting in that were delayed uh, to, to open it up. But, but we, we've had that issue with COVID throughout COVID, whether it be... Um issues related to the design firms in other instances, uh, whether it be related to, uh, unfortunately, the infamous mat mattress issue. <laughs> that yes, <we> yes. <laughs> um, but, but goods and services have truly been uh, impacted. And then I know the other thing that I think that the jail had was just a diminishment in terms of the number of workers that were available. Yeah. Um, so that's the other thing. So, you know, COVID has had, has had impacts that, you know, you think you, you think you kind of know and understand, but when, for us, when you talk about the delay of this jail, you're talking about us continuing to house these inmates in Walton County to a pretty substantial tune yes. um, of dollars that are, you know, continue to impact our budget. And so, you know, it's, it's been really frustrating. I'm not really sure that there's quote unquote, anyone to blame necessarily. I just think it's going to be a um, collateral damage for lack of a better term of this pandemic. But, um, you know, I hope at some point we can add up all the collateral damage because um, it's important to understand the true cost of this pandemic to our community. Um, well, I wonder, can we, I mean, obviously this is, this is a real cost that's inflicted on us. And, I, and I'm very aware of what you talked about, the supply chain issues specifically as it refers, to, as it relates to these niche products uh, for building a jail. I mean, there's, as I toured it, I mean, they have these just incredibly intricate parts and pieces that go into the, the um, electrical systems and the, and the, uh, I mean, it, and, and a lot of it comes from all over the country and even uh, out of the country. And, and uh, the superintendent who was walking me through the job said, look, the guy's got to wear masks. Productivity went down. People are not showing up because they're worried about COVID. Now we can't get the parts from Canada. We can't get the parts from here. He goes, it's just a big problem. So all these costs, like you said, so that's backing up our completion date, but that's our costs of housing inmates in Walton County. Can we draw a line to that and get some of that money from the CARES Act? Well, that's what we're doing. We're keeping a track of when it was supposed to have been. What, they, what the builder has claimed as COVID related, I believe that we mm -hmm. should be able to at least file whether we get it or not. Uh, because I, I think it's a direct correlation to COVID yes. of the continued impact. So that's a, that's part of uh, the, the county's perspective is, okay, yes, you've delayed this, but we know our cost is dollar X every day. Uh, $55 per head per night that they're, they're, they're in there. So, so that, okay, 55 doesn't sound bad, but when you're sending 150, 200 inmates, uh, that, yeah, that's, that's 10, that's 10 grand a day. Yeah, hey, that's, that's so, amazing. So we, we can calculate that very easily. Uh, of course, getting it through FEMA is a whole other issue. So, but we're going to at least try. 
No, that's fantastic. Well, the final thing, I, I, I thought this would be a short uh, session, but wow, we just talked, we covered a lot of great topics. And of course, I couldn't help but weigh in on a, a couple of them that got the blood pressure going. Uh, but I do want to ask Janice this, because this was something that was a nugget that came out at the last meeting at the very beginning. And I was astonished that the media didn't pick it up, because to me, I thought it was a very profound statement when we talked about the 8.48 million that we're getting um, from the old oil, oil spill settlement from Transocean and Halliburton. Uh, I mean, that's found money, right, Janice? And so mm -hmm. two questions, have we got it yet? And uh, number two, uh, I hope that Commissioner Bender was, was, was just being uh, speaking in jest when he said we want to keep it on the beach because uh, I don't think that's going to happen. So have we got it? How can we use it? Is, it, is there any um, restrictions on how we use it? And please tell me you haven't spent it already. That's a lot mm -hmm. in one question. <laughs> You caught me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, we have not spent it yet. Um, it is my understanding that we should get a voucher this week, you know, to be able to, for the chairman to sign um, to receive the funds. Um, I have not read the, um, the uh, judgment yet on it so that I can see, but I, it's my understanding there, it isn't necessarily um, tied to any particular uh, expense, expenditure, but we will definitely make sure that that's not in the documentation. That okay. they're, that it, you know, um, so it's general, general fund, unrestricted money. Boom. That is what I understand, but I, you know, I make sure you read it and make sure that it doesn't have, you know, I, I could see how it could have, you know, um, guidelines or specific requirements on it because it is related to the oil spill. Sure. But I think we should definitely read it and make sure that, um, that we know for sure that it doesn't. And then once we do that, we'll, uh, I know that the legal department, um, has hopefully that documentation and we'll make sure. Are we going to get an update on that tomorrow at our meeting? Um, I meet with the attorney this morning, so I will ask if they have received the documentation and we will make sure. Mm -hmm. Well, guys, uh, I appreciate this. Um, what we're going to do, we're going to do this monthly now, the first Wednesday of the month, now that COVID is kind of subsiding. I mean, I know it's still a huge problem, but we're, we're certainly, we've turned the corner. There is no doubt looking at the chart, looking at the graph of the deaths, the new cases, positivity, hospitalizations. So we're going to do this the first um, Wednesday of the month, uh, get back to, to doing it monthly as we did before. And eventually I'd like to do this in person again, as we used to do before. Um, Cause that's always a blast getting out into the district and meeting people face to face. But of course, until we're totally out of the woods, we're not going to do it. So um, Janice uh, all the way through the summer. And since the spring, you've, you've gotten up every Wednesday morning early. I appreciate that. Uh, pa Chief Powell, appreciate you uh, coming on several times. Eric Gilmore, everyone, all, all the guests who've come in. But uh, I believe the first Wednesday of the month is what we're going to do. And I'll bring a, a special guest each time. And of course, Janice, hopefully you'll be able to make it each time too to give an update from the county and uh, really appreciate it. So uh, you guys have a great rest of the day. We'll see you both uh, at the meeting tomorrow, the meetings tomorrow. And uh, everyone who watched online, we're going to have this on, um, on myscambi.com and also it'll be on my Facebook page at Commissioner Bergash, so you can watch it and refer back to it. And just appreciate everyone being here. Debbie Kenny, thank you. Debbie King, thank you for being producer. here. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the producer <laughs> that you don't see. Um, and everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.